And welcome back to Property Matters on Dublin South FM with myself, Carol Tallon. You can contact us on Twitter at iProperty Radio or indeed email the show at hello at iPropertyRadio.com. I'm now joined by Declan Leonard, Group Head of Project Delivery at PM Group. Declan, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, Carol. Uh, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, delighted. Um, so, Declan, most people will be well familiar with PM Group. But just for, for anybody who isn't, you might just give a little bit of background about PM Group. Sure. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, so uh, PM Group are an international uh, 100% employee-owned project delivery specialist. Um, so our people um, include engineers, architects, project managers, and construction uh, SMEs. Um, so we've probably been in business, I think we're coming up in 48 years this year, and we've over uh, 3,000 people um, across our organization, that's across Europe, Asia, and the USA. And um, people probably be familiar with us, we primarily work on, uh, primarily work on um, large scale, complex projects. So what you might see in life sciences, including what's quite uh, vaccine facilities and hyperscale uh, data centers and so on. Our role has evolved uh, over the years, really from being designers and constructors to now one of where uh, digital project integration is becoming a, a key uh, service for providing. Very good. Actually, you might just explain that digital service integration. Yeah. So I suppose traditionally we said we would have a, um, I think we would be known for our expertise in project delivery. Um, and I suppose in, in more recent years, uh, what we've been looking to do is bring that traditional project delivery experience and as well as maybe layer that with um, technology. So using the best available technology, then uh, layer that on top of our sort of traditional expertise to provide a much more integrated uh, data-driven approach to project delivery. And I suppose we try and bring that to bear with all of our, our partners, our trade partners, the supply chain. So trying to integrate those people into the project in an organized controlled fashion. And, and that's a sort of a data-centric delivery. Okay. That, that sounds like quite um, uh, an unusual approach. Not Well, a, a change from the traditional approach um, taken. So you're bringing in layers of uh, a supply chain that maybe previously wouldn't have been engaged at this stage at traditional construction. So where is the expertise for this coming in? So I suppose the expertise is 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 has been there traditionally in how we work and how we deliver projects. But the opportunity, I think the opportunity is now which is because of the maybe the abundant net availability of technology and the affordability of that, we are able to provide a more automated sort of a digital integration than maybe would have been possible in the past. So there would have been a lot more manual uh, uh, term, manual inputs in terms of integrating supplier information uh, and communicating with suppliers and trade partners where that opportunity now to digitize and automate a lot of that and provide sort of, you call it, the relevant information in real time to everybody in the project so they can make more effectively more informed decisions to help improve quality and speed and so on. Very good. There's a chicken and egg approach to some of this, you know, when you're dealing with um, uh, sophisticated clients in terms of quite complex projects, are do they tend to be driving this in terms of, of client demands or is it a case that your firm are pushing this? Um, I think there's a combination. Uh, it's a combination of both uh, push and pull, Carol, I would say. I would say our, our clients are certainly, the value for this, maybe for the PM uh, clients is certainly around speed um, and quality. And I suppose speed, when I talk, if you take the life science um, our clients talk about speed to patient. So that's about getting medicines to the market to patients as quickly as possible. Um, and so how, how we deliver that, I suppose, they, they leave some of that expertise to us. And as well, we're uh, pu- uh, pushing forward the proposal that by using better integration, better technology, we can deliver faster and the quality will be better. So they're more focused, I would say, on the outcomes maybe than exactly how we, how we, uh, we organise to deliver. Yeah, that it's an interesting it's an interesting approach. And given the last twelve months have been 
so chaotic and uncertain in terms of the industry. However, I, I can see in terms of some of your projects, what proportion of your projects would have been considered essential and, and have had works continuing over the past 11 and 12 months? Yeah, so I'm not exactly sure the exact percentage, but I I would say we'd be certainly in, in uh, the significant proportion, if not well into the 90s, of, of the PM projects uh, kept progressing. So as I said, the majority of our two top sectors would be um, would be uh, life sciences and uh, mission critical facilities, both of which were deemed essential uh, essential services. So work continued on all of those projects and sites um, uh, during during the level five lockdown, and even you know, out design will continue as normal because we've been uh, lucky enough to be able to uh, work remotely, um, and that does work really uh, efficiently and effectively. Very good. Um, in, in Ireland at the moment, what kind of projects are you involved in that are essential, you know, that are still actually ongoing? So you may be familiar with, there's a project that's just about to go into startup. So we've been working on it probably for the last two years. It's an MSD project, a biotech facility, Ocean Swords, there in County Dublin. Um, mm-hmm. So that's a large scale uh, biologics project uh, where they make a drugs, uh, drug substance. And that, that, that project is in startup mode now. We're we're doing another project for the same client in Carlo, um, and it's a vaccine facility. Um, that project is, is ongoing, and we're just uh, in commissioning maybe for another uh, bio, biotechnology facility for Johnson and Johnson in Cork. So they're they're probably they're large scale, you know, uh, a few hundred million capital type projects, and then on a lot of those uh, life sciences sites and some of the data center sites, there's ongoing uh, smaller remedial refurbishment type projects. Okay. So, what level of? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So I suppose we we have um, we have seen our uh, our our headcount in in Ireland grow um, during the during since last March. So we've been continuously recruiting to try and uh, uh, support our clients in, in in delivering their projects. So it's been it's been uh, quite a positive turn, uh, twelve months for for the PM group. That, that's great to hear. Um, but in terms of disruption of your normal workflows, you know, given that there was such a digital approach taken, was there a high level of disruption um, having to, to um, transition to, to adjust to the new safety protocols? Um, there certainly was. There was a, it was obviously a, certainly a different environment and disruption took on a, a different look than it would appear to four. So... But again, I think because uh, we're working quite a regulated, organized environments and technologies, uh, the, the, the technology that's used in the manufacturing process for those clients and is quite high. They're, they're quite expert in, in technology themselves. So the adoption of technology um, and digital systems to help improve that ways of working and improve the, you know, the separation distances and identifying the number of people that could be in certain area of certain time I suppose that that um, that was relatively uh, easily understood by our clients in those sectors, and so I think I think while there was this huge amount of planning and organisation, I think the acceptance of of how technology could could uh, quickly support that that was that was there already. Yeah, very good. And I, actually, that was one of our primary reasons for wanting to talk to you this week as well, because obviously the um, PM Group we're making headlines, not just in Ireland, but um, across Europe for introducing augmented reality AR onto your building sites. Um, so you might just talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, I'm interested in the technology side of it, something that we've spoken about in a number of times on the show over the last number of years, but it's good to get some insights and practice. But I'm what I'm really interested in is what solution or, or what problem were you trying to solve on sites that led you down the direction of immersive technologies? Okay, Gareth. So I suppose uh, if it won't be any surprise to, to, to anybody that the construction industry has, um, has maybe been slow to adopt uh, technologies uh, and, and move in terms of efficiency over the years. And there, there would be probably, it's probably uh, readily acknowledge that there's, there's, a, there's a reasonable amount of waste in the construction process. Um, I suppose we found the, the solution we were probably trying to solve was the reduce the, the amount of that waste, so the amount of errors and rework in the field. 
um, depending on the sector you're involved in, can be quite substantial. And there's obviously a cost with that rework and there's, there's a time penalty with that. So we were looking for something that could help us be more, reduce that rework, reduce the time and be effectively safer in how we construct and faster, more efficient. So that, that's what we were trying to solve. That sounds that sounds like trying to solve all the problems at once. <laughs> Is that, you know, because there's a number of different, you know, when you talk about waste, it's targeting in to so many areas that um, it doesn't feel like one problem you're solving. It actually feels like a number of problems that you're solving. And, and it was, and that's the beauty of the technology. And that's why I suppose we, we were really keen to, to adopt it and deploy it. Um, because I suppose, imagine, Carl, if you could take a technology that could show you in real time in a proactive way before you started something that there is no, there is not going to be a rework issue. There is not a clash. There is not a design error or a construction error. So having that real time information available, that, that allows you to make a huge amount of better decisions that, that, that solves an awful lot of other problems. Yeah, and I, I, I let, let's get into how the technology works on site because a number of the issues you've identified there um, would be picked up through the use of BIM, you know, in terms of cl- uh, clash detection and things. So what difference does it make for people on site to have, um, to be able to experience the proposed work before it's delivered? What difference does that make as opposed to having reasonably the same data um, through BIM, what, so, what would so, be the difference? So, so Carol, I suppose the, the difference here and the, the real value and benefit is it allows you take that BIM, as you call it, that design BIM, allows you to take that onto the floor, onto the construction floor. Okay, so it allows the, the, the supervisors, the constructors, the trade partners who are, who are physically doing the work in the field, look at that BIM information in real time in an augmented reality. So what has happened in the past is design is taken to a level in the BIM model. Okay, it may not be taken to a completion level. There are a number of various parties involved in, in, in completing out that design. So when that design gets to construction, okay, the setting out, the setting up, the organizing the work trades, all that, that, that intensive amount of work that has to do, sometimes stuff gets lost in translation, and so that setting out is, is not always as per the design intent. So this technology allows you on the spot checking that your design, your construction setup and set out is as per the design intent. So it's a bit like the, um, the, the, the carpenter analogy of, you know, measure twice and cut once. Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually, I, I think immersive technologies and particularly augmented reality, it's a super solution for people who don't have strong visualization skills. Um, so in terms of, of bringing the, the product from the page to life and as somebody who doesn't have, have that uh, visualization skill, I actually find immersive technologies really powerful, you know, much more so than uh, the CGI images or, or plans that, that can fall flat. Um, but I'm aware that you're talking, you know, as with any tech adoption, you know, it's so dependent on the human element. So when you went to deploy this on sites, you know, what was the attitude of the teams that were going to be working with this technology? So I, w- I would say the, the attitude was, was really positive. And I suppose we've been part of the culture and PM has Right. We've always tried to be early adapters of technology. So we were doing BIM and 3D design in the early 90s. So we've been using technology and we, we used to have a strategy in BIM called uh, technology with purpose. So whenever we use technology, we want to have a, a sort of a defined purpose for why we're using it. I think when people understand the purpose and the value, they start to engage a bit more. Um, but I think with this particular product, um, uh, Carol, the the quality of the product was so good that I think people could always say, and because it was a visualization solution, people could see, for a better word, really, really quickly benefits. You know, so they could understand them because when we, when we described what we were trying to do, it was easily understood because it was visual. And then when they used the technology, it was easily, um, they, 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 how do I say, they were able to adapt to it easier because, again, it was a visual solution. So... And I think that they, they, we obviously needed to retrain uh, the people because we have multiple um, nationalities on that site. So 
you have your typical language barriers, but again, because of the technology and the visualization, picture paints a thousand words. This was a technology that you didn't have to, you know, you didn't have to have perfect English for um, to train the rest of the, uh, the guys on site. And I suppose we were really supported by uh, XYZ, who were the, the product builders here, in terms of training and the utilization of, of that on site as well. Yeah, and the training is a really key one, but that's an interesting one about actually, I, I I hadn't considered that, that if you were employing other types of technologies, that there may be even an element of a language barrier on sites. And of course, that's a great point. Um, you know, one of the really interesting things when, when um, a company trials technology, you know, you hope the benefits are going to be as you expect they're going to be, but there are also some unintended consequences and they can be both positive and negative. So in terms of you deploying this solution on site, have there been any unintended consequences? Um, I'd say, Carl, it's, 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 it's early, early stages at the moment in terms of its deployment. Um, so, and I would say the initial feedback from both our client, our guys on site using the technology and the partnership with XYZ, it's all really positive. Um, so I would say, I don't think there's been any, there's certainly been no negative uh, unintended consequences. And I would suggest that maybe um, some of the positive ones, they're just starting to come to life. So the use of the technology, um, we have prescribed a number of use cases in terms of using the technology to check clashes, to check setting out but there are a lot more uh, use, cases, uh, use cases evolving now because as people are getting comfortable with it, they are thinking of their, what, what we need to do in the next phase of construction or the next phase of commissioning. So they are already, there's a bit of, um, I would say, a, a, a herd mentality now about going, this technology can do lots more. So it's, I think maybe we didn't uh, expect it to be, um, people to be so enthusiastic and to be maybe uh, challenging other opportunities in the future so i think that that's a very positive uh unintended consequence yeah. maybe Declan, that's a really interesting one because you're absolutely right. As people become more familiar with the technology, people who are already very familiar with how to do their job on site, then they see other use cases for it. So that will be a really interesting one. We might check in with you in another few months to see how that's going. I think it's really helpful for um, traditional construction firms who might be listening into this to hear about that because in some, in some um, cases we hear that people are concerned that maybe the team will be resistant to using technology. So it's really good to hear about actually the teams, once they're fully trained, become very enthusiastic about technology to the point where they're looking at further cases as well. So that's that's another interesting one. So um, hopefully we'll be able to check in with you in a few months and see how that's going and see if any potential alternative use cases have come up on site. Because again, that would be something that could be shared with interest across across the sector. Um, and I'm sure uh, the, the augmented reality developers here would be interested in that. Sure, so, Caroline. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was Declan Leonard, Group Head of Project Delivery at PM Group. We'll be back after a quick break. <laughs>